All right. Um, yes, this is another topic on the African or the black and white discrimination. Of course, um, if you are a student of literature, you have come across this before. It's a prose, and of course, it's a non-African prose. Uh, native song is written by Richard Wright. We all know that in the era where there was serious racial segregation across the earth, um, especially between the blacks and the whites, there was a need for some people to put these things into careful writing for posterity's sake. And of course, Richard Wright was able to articulate me you know, fashion out a very interesting story for us. And here we are today studying it as one of the texts for literature. Uh, permit me to take you on this short journey. As I start by talking about the characters involved in the story, talking about the theme, what the story centers around, and of course, its importance in your examination. All right, as a way of starting the character list, we would have Bigger Thomas on the list of that. Bigger Thomas is in focus, the major character. We have Buddy Thomas, his younger brother. We have Vera Thomas, the younger sister. And of course, Mrs. Thomas. Now, Mr. Thomas was, I mean, is mentioned slightly in the story. We are told that Mr. Thomas died in a riot. That's all we know about the father. Okay? Now, this is as much as the family circle is concerned. Now, there are other people that relate to it in the story. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dalton. They are the landlords. And, and employers of Peter Thomas. So we have Gus G H Jack. Okay. As friends, the friends of Giga. And we have the man we call Doc. He runs a pool room. Okay. Now, there's what we call the black belt. That's black community. Okay, then we have another character that's the daughter of this Mr. and Mrs. Doughty. Mary Doughty, the daughter. Okay, she's white, she's a white girl. Now, another lady there is Bessie. She's the girlfriend of Giga Thomas. In this story, Giga kills her to hide his secret. Mary here, Giga kills her mistakenly. Okay? So, having mentioned that, we we'll touch Mr. Buckley. Okay? Then we we'll touch the Brit Mr. Britain, the inspector. Okay? We we'll touch Max. John's friend. John. A. Boris. 
Max Abels. Okay, Dan is a boyfriend of Mary Dalton. And he is a communist. He's a communist. Okay? Then Reverend Hammond. He prays for bigger before his execution. Place of bigger before his execution. Okay? Who else? That's about the names we have to mention in the story. Now, this story is a story that concerns every black man and white man across the world. If you are black and you are listening to this right now, or you are white and you are listening to this right now, this story is an objective angle to the need to end racial discrimination. In fact, in recent times, we saw the case of uh, George Floyd, a young man who was killed, uh, murdered, you know, in cold blood by a white police officer in America. Of course, we have cases where blacks also maltreat whites or do something racial or racist in nature to whites. Okay? This is an objective side to it, saying that it makes no sense in any regard. Okay? The writer of the story, you know, illustrates vividly how the blacks lived in this era, how the whites lived. The wishes, the aspirations, and the desires on the heart of the whites and that of the blacks. The hatred the whites see on, written all over the face of the blacks on a daily basis, the retribution. And of course, the blacks also, the, the longing they have to having the kind of lives that the whites actually had at the time in question. So this story is set in the 1940s in America, somewhere in Harlem, Chicago. And of course, it tells us how much racial discrimination has been entrenched in the fabrics of our existence. Okay? Now, the story is about the family of the Thomases. Okay? Peter Thomas is the firstborn, but the Thomas is the secondborn, and Peter Thomas is the daughter, the last one. Why Mrs. Thomas is the mother, and Mr. Thomas, like I told you, is the father. We never get to see much about him because he died in a riot. This was revealed to us later on in an interview between John and Bigger Thomas. Of course, it's in that same interview, we got to know that Bigger originally did not live in Chicago. He lived in Mississippi with his family. In Mississippi with his family. And at the time, at the time of the interview with John, he has just been in Chicago for five years. Okay, so that's the background to their family. Now, this family is so poor that every day they live from hand to mouth. The only hope, the only thing they have is the religion and the prayers and the hope and aspirations that someday things will turn out fine and better. Just like the way you and I we look up to the Western world and pray and hope that something will change someday. And of course, that is that about the family. Now, the second family that the story touches is a white family, the family of the Mr. and Mrs. Dalton. We call them the Daltons, okay? These ones are quite rich. The father is a philanthropist, that's Mr. Dalton. He is a real estate investor, and of course, he's the owner or he's the landlord. He owns the highest shares in the house where Bigger and his family live in. Okay, now Bigger also has his own life. He has a circle of friends. Bigger has friends such as Gus, G.H. and Jack. These are black friends. They are black folks. And together they run a den of thieves. Okay, they run a gang of robbers. Okay, their, their modus operandi is to attack black families. When they see that a black man is a little well-to-do, probably the black man has a little education and throw that to the whites. Um, bigger together with us, Jinch and Jack, they go to rob these people and cut away with their property. 
In fact, sometimes it's a you know break in. They only break into the house to take things without the knowledge of the people. Okay? And that is how Giga has been surviving. But his mother does not approve of that lifestyle. She knows essentially that that lifestyle will only bring rain to the sun. She has been on a constant move to remind him that it is better he turns away from such a lifestyle and picks up a much more responsible way of life. And in that, she means that bigger should pick up a job and start to work on a job to support her. The little she is making from her place of work is not really enough to feed the family. She needs an extra hand. So she advises Bigger to quit his rascally way of life, to pick up a job and to support her. And to be candid, Bigger gives it a thought, he gives it a try, but he can't just imagine that the whites always have the good things of life. Bigger being a very odd tempered person, being a very odd tempered Okay, so um, he, he, he doesn't just like that lifestyle. He wants to get something for himself. And as a result of that, you see him as a hot tempered person. Okay, he's not happy about being hot tempered, but he just feels he cannot control it. He feels that the whites provoke him with their so perfect life. He wants to do something to change the fortune of his family, but it's almost impossible because the whites control everything in the land. The good goes to them, the blacks are made to endure or to make do with whatever is available. And as a result of that, you see him when the anger comes, he wants to do something violent. Okay, to the point that when he got the job, eventually he changed his mind from a particular robbery. He, together with his friends, decides to go on a robbery. But at the point of the robbery, you know, a fight occurred between E and GH, and of course, which led to the, the scattering of the plan. They all decided to go separately so that they can actually rethink and cool down their minds. So Bigger and Jack went to see a movie, the two um, feature movie. Because in the movie, he sees that the daughter of the Doubtings is missing. There was a breaking news, okay? And he's beginning to wonder that. So the, the children of the whites also have rascally lives like the blacks, okay? He couldn't believe that such a very high profile family will have a daughter who is that rascally. And this ignites the interest in him. He wants, he feels like he has seen someone who is closer to his kind of behavior. So he wants to get to know her. So he wants to be in the family, whether he can through that understand them, okay? And see even if he can plan a robbery against them. And as such, the second movie he saw was about the African society, the African life, where the African children are depicted with so, many, uh, so much demeaning, you know, uh, emanciating structure. And of course, you will see that in the end, he comes to a conclusion that he is not going for the robbery, he is to join the job offer. He goes to the house, picks up the job. On the night he gets there, is the night he resumes the duty. The Doubtings welcome him, gave him all sorts of encouragement to the point that Mrs. Doubting, who is a blind uh, woman, informs him that she would like to send him to school. But Bigger is here to make what? A decision. Essentially, his first duty starts that night is to take the daughter. His job is to be a driver, a chauffeur. is to drive the daughter from the house to the school, the university premises, and to bring her home. But on the way, the daughter changes her mind and says he should take her to her boyfriend's place in the office. From there, they decide to move around town. Okay, and Jan, who is a white boy, he is also in a political party, he's a communist. Why Mr. Doubting is a capitalist. It's just like the APC and PDP in Nigeria. Okay, so the communists and the capitalists, they don't see eye to eye. So Mr. Doubting doesn't like Jan because he's a communist. Okay, but the daughter is fighting the system. She keeps dating this guy. And instead of going to school, she has gone to see him. So Jan is an open-minded person. He's a liberalist, a communist, and he decides that big guys should drive him to the black community, that they want to see how the blacks live. And of course, getting there, a lot of things happened, which resulted into Jan finding out more about the life of Biga. Biga explains everything, which I said earlier on, especially about how his father is killed, and of course, how he has moved from Mississippi to Chicago. And of course, Jan encourages him to let him know that they are both humans. There's no black, there's no white. Okay? In the long run, they have so much to drink, 
they had enough liquor in their system and Mary decides it's enough and they have to go home. On the way home, Biga was driving and through the mirror in the front, he could see Jan and uh, Mary at the back seat. They were kissing each other and fondling with each other. And of course, a few blocks from the house of Mary, because the father does not like to see Jan, Jan steps out of the car and tells Biga to take Mary home. On getting to the house, Mary is too drunk to go upstairs. She calls on Biga, Biga carries her upstairs. And while he carries her, he starts to find out uh, fantasize about being with a white woman. Of course, there have been a law that has been passed because most black men believe that sleeping with a white lady removes all the causes of the black race from whoever sleeps with a white lady. And because of this superstition, many black men start to rape white ladies. And because of this, there has to be a law to protect the white ladies. And the law says that if you are seen as a black man very close to a white woman, it's death sentence because it is believed that it is an attempt to rape. Okay? And as a result of that, big guy is carrying Mary into the room. The family, the parents, Mr. Dalton and Ms. Dalton are asleep. The maid, Peggy. Okay? Peggy. Peggy is also asleep. And so Bigger carries Mary into the room. Mary holds on to him and asks him in a way for him to stay with her in the room. Mrs. Dalton heard the door when it opens. She decides to trace Mary to the room. Only to get there, Bigger was just laying Mary on the bed and was on top of her. So, in order not to be discovered in the room, since Mrs. Dalton is blind, Mrs. Dalton rather, Bigger slides to the side of the bed and uses his hand to cover Mary's mouth. But he was he scared that Mary can still utter words, so he took the pillow to cover her face. In the long run, he kills her in the process by putting the pillow on her face and she suffocates to death. Mrs. Dalton prays and touches the daughter, prays over her, not knowing it's the last prayer, and goes back to the room. Bigger decides to reset Mary's head, only to discover that he has killed her mistakenly. This, to him, has compounded his problem. First, it will be it will be an attempt to rape. He will be charged for raping her and then killing her to conceal the evidence. As a result of this, he started pacing around the room seeking ideas or ways to conceal or hide that incident. And to be honest, he thought so hard and all he could think of was to implicate or is to implicate Jan as the one who killed Mary. So he decides to hide the body of Mary that by so doing, he could lay a claim of kidnapping. And so, he puts the body in a trunk and pushes it downstairs. But as he was going down, the head of Mary could not hide into the trunk. It was dangling and making fun of him as her eyes were open, though she's dead. And so, he couldn't bear it. He turned back the trunk into the room, got nylon, spread on the floor, put the body there, rushed downstairs, got a matchet, cutlass, and pieces the body of Mary into parts, and then packs it up, then puts it in the trunk. Now the body fits well. Pushes it downstairs, carries the nylon and the whole body, dumps it into the incinerator and lights fire on it, pours dirt and paper on top of it, then lights fire so that the body can burn overnight. And so, after cleaning up, as he was turning to enter back into the house, Mrs. Apeggy wakes up and opens the door to see him. He tells a lie that Mary asks him to pick the trunk of her clothes and take it outside to the front of the house because in the morning, she was scheduled actually to travel. She was to travel to France, I guess, by train. Okay, and so he said that she needs the trunk outside. And so Peggy believed him and went back inside. Unfortunately, Biga was not happy that someone saw him. He wanted to do it in such a way that he would dump the body and disappear and act as though he didn't come home. Okay, but that's as he spots the plan and he had to stay. Long story short, he ransacked the, the clothes and the bags of Mary. He picked clothes at random, put them in the trunk and went to put it where he said. Unknown to him, he, picked, he selected the old clothes. Mrs. Dalton had bought new clothes for Mary, and this actually was something that spoiled the old scenario for Bigger. If Mary would have traveled naturally, she would have packed the new clothes, but he packed the old ones. As such, dropping the trunk, he left for the house. In his house, it was uneasy. He tried to tell his family members that everything is okay, but Bigger, I mean, Buddy sees some notes, dollars in his pocket. 
and he decides to get a share of it in order to keep quiet. So from that house, he goes to the house of Bessie, his girlfriend. He tells her of what has happened, that Mary is missing, okay, but no one knows about it. Bessie is suspicious of Bigger, but Bigger did not let the cat out. He goes back to the house. On getting to the house, he finds out that people are, Mr. Dalton has started to look for the daughter. Long story short, one thing leads to the other. Bigger decides to use the incidents to make some money from the Thomases by going back to his girlfriend and telling her that they have to write a kidnap note, just like Penelope did in one of the stories they read, okay, where they wrote a kidnap note saying that they were the ones who kidnapped the daughter and that they should, the, the parents of the kidnapped child should send money somewhere and they will see their son, or the son rather. And eventually they did, but the son did not come. And so they had to with the money. This was his own exit plan. He intended to get $10,000 so that he can run out of that community and take best in with him and be in a high life society. Unfortunately, Bessie begins to get scared. What if they get caught? And he is beginning to get paranoid that Bessie is not as confident as to join him in his crime. He decides to force her to do it. Long story short, Bessie followed him to the hideout. Whereas in the house, Bigger's job is to be going to the house to find out what the latest is, what those people plan to do, so that he can influence them to actually pay the money. But on his way home, he discovered that Mr. Britton had been hired, a private investigator, and that one compounded his problem. He became uneasy. Unfortunately, he thought that he would be caught because the cutlass with which he used to cut Mary was still lying on the floor. As the investigator was questioning him directly as though he knew something, he acted scared, and so Mrs. Dalton felt like he was innocent and he should not be questioned. He passed hurriedly, picked the cutlass, and went to hide it. When the case became heated, he knew that they were after him. He started to run. He went to the hideout where he asked the money to be brought. Nobody brought the money. Bessie became scared that they found them out. But Bigger says it is not so. Unfortunately, he sees that Bessie is chicken hearted and she might run out overnight to go and cry to inform the police. He decides to get her drunk. She gets drunk, he rapes her, and then he takes a brick wall, a brick from the wall, and smashes her head in her sleep. After smashing the head open, he carries the body and throws the body into a ventilating fan, which grates the body into pieces. And he feels that his plan has been achieved. Trying to escape, the police ransack the area. He began to run from one hiding place to the other. At that point, guilty mind that been established. It is now clear that it is Bigger Thomas. In a shootout to the police, Bigger runs and eventually is caught. And then it becomes a cake court case. In the court of law, John, whom Bigger had lied against initially, came with his lawyer friend to fight for Bigger. Eventually, Max tried in the court of law. He fought hard. He raised every case reasonable, saying that Bigger is, a victim, is the victim in this case. Because what you see him do is as a result of what he has seen separately and what has been done to him or blacks like him. And as a result of that, you cannot give what you don't have. It is what he has been given that he is given back. So he pleads and he asks that he be allowed to send the girl back to his home but with little punishment. However, the case has already been decided. And so Mr. Buckley, who ran, ran as the second term for the post of the Attorney General, decided the case and sentenced Bigger to death by electrocution. In the end, when Amon came to pray, comes to pray for him, Bigger is filled with hatred and rage that he, the Reverend is hypocritical, that an unbeliever like Boris Amos was the one who stood to fight for him. However, a parish that he had attended all his life could not even raise money to get him a lawyer. And so, in his dying words, he refused to talk to anybody, to no one, till he is executed. The story ends where Bigger is seated on a chair to be executed. We do not know if he is executed or not. And this brings us to the end of the story. I hope it was interesting and we are able to try one or two things from it. That the writer is trying to say that racial segregation can cause a whole lot. It should be stopped from both ends. Thanks for listening.